issue of skill gap, which is one of the most pressing issues because everybody but your grandmother is probably talking about it. Um, and it's also one of the issues of uh, the interaction between university and its environment because industry frequently accuses academia of not doing enough of making them to reskill recent graduates, of uh, producing graduates who are not able to innovate and change the industry and propel it forward. On the other hand, universities say, well, how can you possibly do it if you are so closed, if you are not telling us what you need specifically, if you are not helping us, if you are not making the step forward? So. Apparently, is the problem that should be somehow solved in a collaboration between academia and industry. But still, before that, universities, every university, must determine their specific place in this equation. Um, are you a strategy partner? Are you a strategic partner? Or maybe you are a driver, maybe you are the leader here. Maybe universities must determine how the future should look like produce graduates who can actually make that future happen, who are capable of critical action and changing the reality to fit the vision of universities. In any case, regardless of that, whether you see yourself as a partner or you see yourself as a driver, uh, it seems that universities are not up to task um, from either of these perspectives, they must change. They must somehow reimagine themselves for the 21st century. Um, and to do that, um, they have to start somewhere. So today, um, we will discuss these possible points of departure. Uh, my name is Dara Melnik. I'm the head of the research group uh, at Skolko um, Education Development Center, uh, Moscow School of Management, Skolkovo, which is in Russia. Um, also, we have Vladica Svetkovic from Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, he will speak a little bit about the leadership. So if we are trying to change something, it kind of makes sense to change those who run universities and who determine how they function specifically. Um, then um, Jasna Atanasievich uh, will talk a little bit about challenges that the academia faces because um, a lot of things are changing. The very nature of work and labor market is changing. And to uh, transform universities, we must first speak about the challenges they have to respond to. And finally, um, whether we talk of um, small um, iterative changes in collaboration with the industry or powerful changes caused by universities, we need trailblazers that show us the way. We need experimental universities that have enough uh, boldness and courage to start something new. And today we have Mr. Shridit uh, from uh, the Global Institute of Integral Management Studies in India, who will talk a little bit about the practices they are trying out and the approaches that are working and maybe not working for them as well. W would you begin, please? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. So I will spend my 10 minutes, or maybe even less, as I promised, in speaking about one third of this um, topic for today. And this is the role of academia. In, in other words, I will be speaking about the importance of prerequisites for all these things that we hear in the entire conference to tomorrow and uh, yesterday and, and today. So if we agree that all the issues we somehow formulated, we need to do some changes. I, mean, I think this, this statement is valid. <coughs> then those, cha those changes should be undertaken. And my first order questions are, who is supposed to design, conduct, and monitor this this fundamental shift in education that we are speak constantly speaking about here, or in, not or and, in which academic environment they should occur. So this, these are two, for me, first order questions. 
And even if I put that in a single one, a single question, then it is whether we are now at present um, right people and suitable environment for achieving the goals that we are facing. I think that, so what occurred to me is that this uh, is the fourth conference. And please, your, your name is, again, I cannot. Srijit, okay. So maybe I have a question for you uh, because you were present at, at other conferences. I, I can imagine that many things that we hear now were repeated. Uh, just now uh, we are repeating them because they were present at, at, at previous conferences as well. So I can really expect that in the fifth conference we will be speaking about the same thing. What <coughs> is to be faced or what, what we... I mean, we all know that we live in a fast-changing society, that the needs are not the same today as they were before, that our mobile phones contain information and blah, blah, blah. But this is uh, the point that we have to think about the changes and who will do it and, and in which environment. So we need people. And when I say people, I mean that these are people presently living and working in the academic environment. These, these are not some people that we have to imagine. No, this is the people that we have. So in order to face the future needs, we uh, have to, to be aware that we have to do it with the people that we have now and that we that they their characteristics, their, their nature was defined before. So they are from the past uh, from the past. So we uh, selected them in the past, we uh, control their quality in the past. We have to face the future with the people from the past. So this is my, my first uh, half conclusion. We cannot face the problems if we don't have enough people which are self-confident, motivated, capable, social, so socially responsible, and created. So do, do we need, do, do we have, or we have probably a lack of such people? The environment, I would merge with people because we cannot define envir environment if you don't speak about whether you have high quality people and high decision making positions. So it is not a point that we have the highest possible quality people. Nobody has that. And of course, I, when I address uh, the environment and the people, all the systems can be uh, seen individually. I don't speak about the world situation, but you can integrate it. Anyway, even if you speak individually, then you have to think whether you have that good distribution of people in terms of decision making uh, situation. Then the environment outside of the quality of the people, uh, you can think it is designed, of course, according to the procedure, administration, everything else. Is it transparent? Is it common interest driven? Or it is something something uh, else. Can we successfully respond to future needs if we don't first solve the past damages? I think that it is not possible. And of course, I am referring here to the countries or the systems that are much closer to Serbia than to Germany or, or Switzerland, but uh, never mind. You, you can um, just... Um, take a look on some documents and see what is the situation uh, European-wide in the Bologna frame, which covers some 37 or more million of students, millions of students. And just a quick look, and you, you can see that, that more than 50% of Bologna frame higher education assistance uh, can get in, in, in only 50 uh, percent. You can get some pedagog pedagog pedagogic pedagog 
pedagogical, okay? Um, improvement of, of skills for the high education teachers only on request. And some countries, you cannot get it at all. So the problem of uh, those skills that are lacking in our higher education uh, has been recognized long. I mean, Bologna was signed more than 15 years ago, if I remember. So, yes? So, and we still are s slowly progressing, or whether it is a progress at all, I don't know. Again, half of the countries, they don't have national strategies of uh, using new technologies in teaching. Again, only half of them they have. Some of them, they don't have procedures at all. How many? I think that I, I have an, uh, uh, a good uh, data that uh, says only one third is using code of recruitment, which is widely accepted in, 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 in some highly developed countries, I mean, in terms of education. Uh, in many countries, we still do recruitment, which is not, which is really bad. So that if it is a long-term problem, then with whom you are going to produce such proactive changes? How I'm going, how I'm staying with my time? I, I have a couple of sentences more. As is long it as okay? You remain okay, okay. No, no, this is okay <laughs> because uh, I open probably some room for discussions further on. Then I will, uh, I will finish. But th this is really communicating with, with something that we heard on the plenary session today. The second guy, I would say, from, from, from Netherlands, he pointed out that we need changes and trans uh, uh, interdisciplinarity in teaching and in, in producing programs. I just wonder how many people take part at this conference which speak in favor of that and which fight against that in their communities. I know a couple of them, but I don't mention, I will not mention the name. So just, I will finish with this, uh, uh, how to tackle that problem of, the, of prerequis prerequisites with individual systems, because I, I said I speak about um, many local systems. So 100 times we can hear here think globally, but act locally. All the changes should, of course, be done locally. And then we speak about individual systems. So what is the condition of, of each system? The people that take part in that system should pose that question to themselves. Oh, it's OK. For you, and I will finish that, just Im imagine a range, a, ra a simple range of the institutions in terms of the time span, according to the time span that it is needed to solve a terrible case of plagiarism. Let's say of political influential people that did it in the academic environment. So the institution which solves it in a few months or a couple, only two or three months, as we have an example in University of Tübingen very recently, or Zimbabwe, so it needs a couple of years, or maybe. Or even worse countries, I just hesitate to, to mention the name. Do you need, do you think that this wide range can assume that all these institutions can behave proactively in the same way? I don't believe. I think that this test would say very um, openly what you can expect from these environments. You can ex expect many storytelling moments, but no active doing. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you, Vladica. Um, does anybody have questions? Or we can do it. Afterwards, if we have time. Um, oh, but yeah, so perhaps um, y you would like to say that Vladica is completely wrong and you have a... 
a radically different idea. Okay, as long as you can provide argumentation, that's fine as well. Um, do you guys have questions? Um, I would like to ask one, uh, because I'm afraid I'll forget it by the end of our um, presentations. So if we have people from the past who have to somehow take our universities into the future, what can be done? What are the possible mechanisms of upgrading them to fit the contemporaneity? I would say that it strongly depends on the individual system. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they should recognize their own problems. If you have a uh, totally wrong selection procedure that lasts for 20 years, so it means that you have to change it immediately because the last best moment to change it was 20 years ago and the first next is now. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is it. <coughs> Yeah, but the problem here is, uh, I'll get it back to the topic of your presentation. So we have prof students who have to be taught something new. We have professors who have to teach them something new. And we have administration who has to organize that. And you're saying that the selection system must be changed, but what do you do with the ones who are already there? How to make them open fab labs? Then you have to think about the procedures or to when you make a reform you don't have the same credit to high quality and l l low quality right. people you have to recognize them maybe it is an utopia but I don't think anything else is is good mm. if I may suggest an answer to that question if we're dealing with uh, teachers or educators who are of the old guard and maybe hired on their own criteria maybe even on the basis of corruption like in Indonesia where I was also the people I came to start paying was to die. What do you do in, in such a situation? I think the best solution is uh, curriculum design because they're not going to resist that. Those kinds of people are quite happy for someone to, 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 to write and curriculum and content and by the time they finish teaching it a few times perhaps they don't even understand it.
Ясно. Um, I feel you have a comment in response, and you can also yeah. then begin your presentation. And it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would just like to add to this uh, list of ideas how to deal with old people. <laughs> to they're not old, they're just from the past. Linking or making, responsibilizing uh, ins educational institutions to the market. So make it's a bit, bit stressful. Those policies are difficult to apply because usually there are resistances uh, from vested interests. But making uh, making institutions more responsible to the market, more close, exposed to the market needs is the way, also one way uh, to think about. And the other, uh, again, uh, mobilization of market, uh, stream of mobilization of market uh, discipline is to better inform future students what are their prospects on the market uh, from yeah, old, <laughs> type of institutions or from different institutions that are offering educational programs. I, I, I have the impression that there are some. Yes, and then we'll proceed to. It's dangerous. I agree. I agree. That's why. I and then, who's responsible for them being self-reflected, if not universities, right? I so agree. And I think um, the last comment before Yasna's presentation. <laughs> Which has using, been started. Using some yeah. of the key words. So first of all, gap. There is the word gap. There is a huge financial gap. SDGs and the money needed for mm. the implementation. The annual gap is in between 1.7 trillion and 2.5 trillion dollars. So there is a work cut out for everyone in too many ways. So to resolve the issue, and there was a reference, uh, this notion of, okay, baby boomers, okay, you have, to, you have to withdraw from the scene and give the space to the new generation. I think one can do it through unconventional forms of learning, that is, there are real life issues. You don't have to take it in a lab type of situation, okay? Uh, 169 targets, okay? These are real life issues on, on, the, on draft. So we leave the new generation, students, to attack those issues. The question is, and this is a well-resolved question, how you incentivize people? Who will pay for it? There is no money. The credit system is not technology. It might be okay in the context of one university or a Chinese network of universities, but if you would like to go in between, I don't know, Serbia and the UK and other countries, the recognition of packages of work credited is unresolved. So people cannot be expected to work for free. So there are a couple of issues, but there is work, there is a need, and there's nothing going on. I didn't, okay. Noted. Yes, I, I uh, so new state policy will limit the number of questions after the presentation to three. <laughs> 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 and then so that we that have, can I'm have a discussion in the open end. some new questions yeah. because in such a short time, uh, it's, it will be difficult to make some complex analysis, but at least, and, and I'm economist, we like to simplify the world, maybe oversimplify, but at least I will try economists to... Economists simplify things? Okay, that's yes, new. Try Tell us to about to it. To, to <laughs> reduce to just few variables and then talk in the <laughs> simplified <laughs> model, <coughs> which is not always, uh, and take some bold hypotheses, I would say. Uh, so. Uh, I will. I would link to what Vladica has raised and try to put some different light on it and more to be more specific uh, about how uh, these uh, uh, global challenges that we have been talking about during this conference and in many other similar uh, events, occasions, and uh, and studies, and how it translates to the development context to countries like Serbia, which is something that. 
from where Vladica uh, took uh, uh, his examples. Uh, so just to, um, to, to summarize what we have heard and where we, I think, all agree that we have today uh, impor an important skills gap uh, related to the significant shift in the economy, in technology, and it will be even greater in the future as some professions will be replaced by machines. We even don't know which kind of, uh, lab of professions we will need uh, on the labor market in the future. So we need to pay attention on two type of skills gap. On one side, I, I will try to summarize and to simplify, <laughs> sorry, if for the sake of clarity. Uh, one part, one type of skills are, let's call them hard skills. They are related to all digital uh, industry 4.0 uh, demand that is created in the economy, meaning programming, data analytics, development of artificial intelligence, those skills that need will need, be, uh, uh, need will be needed to be incorporated in various other uh, professions, let's say, or uh, profiles. Uh, on the other side, we are all talking about some, let's call them soft skills, which are uh, unlike hard skills, where w w which are easy to, I, I can say easy to teach, but we are facing challenge in terms of speed and how to reach the larger scale. On the other side, we are facing the huge gap in soft skills and we will be even more needing them in the future, meaning flexibility, problem solving, curiosity, creativity, uh, multidisciplinary thinking, empathy, we, we, we hear very often empathy, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, all those set of, of skills there will, which will be important and which will not be <coughs> replaced by uh, <coughs> machines and artificial intelligence and robots in the future. Bad news in, is that these skills are hard to teach. Uh, they are, they are, um, uh, it's, a it's a huge challenge and it's something that we need to pay attention to. I personally uh, believe that, uh, and what is also important that we need to integrate all those skills throughout all educational cycles to, to, to be able to have adequate profiles at the end on the labor market. What I believe personally is that as many times in the past where, where we had shifts in technology, uh, educational system would somehow cope with it and as the most creative and the most open-minded segment of the society will find a way to respond, a way adapt. And the fact that we are having this conference and that we are discussing these issues means that there is a huge awareness at least and even uh, will to to find solutions and to adapt uh, what I would uh, like I would like to to emphasize here is uh, my observation uh, that um, these uh, soft skills that we will need in abundance uh, we already need and it will be even more important in the future are traditionally uh, developed and uh, uh, nurtured and taught in the area of social sciences and humanities. Uh, what what does it mean uh, for uh, for um, the future programs development and delivery in very practical terms? Uh, we need, now I will use another buzzwords, we will need to make interdisciplinary programs to uh, transcendent all other disciplines with these, uh, uh, with the elements from that are, that are traditionally uh, represent, that were represented exclusively or almost exclusively in programs in social sciences, meaning management, communication, teamwork, uh, uh, leadership, uh, all, all those courses or teaching methods that are incorporated in the, uh, 
courses about society, about relationships in the society, um, uh, policies, uh, how to deal with them, and all those topics that are re reserved for social science. So having said all that, I would now like to uh, put more light into how, it, how all these uh, findings <laughs> translate into a development context. Uh, for countries such as Serbia or various other middle-income countries, how this skills gap will translate to their development or where, which challenges here we need to be aware of. Uh, first, what we were all optimistic about and uh, hopefully it reflects in our economic development is that there, were, there was uh, an important opportunity from the industry 4.0, from the technology shifts. Creative disruption is going on, and we are uh, traditionally strong in countries, in middle-income countries, uh, uh, like Serbia, like Romania, like uh, various other, uh, other countries of similar uh, uh, development path. Uh, we are strong in STEM uh, sciences, in mathematics, in uh, uh, engineering. And it creates a huge opportunity for innovative startups, IT industry that is, that is uh, emerging. And it's good development that is happening. What is not good is that the, the same countries are relatively uh, weaker and it's also a part of the legacy of tradition, of uh, consequence of authoritarian regimes where social sciences were considered as dangerous and needed to be under uh, watch <laughs> of uh, political authorities and uh, not, uh, they were not de de uh, developed under meritocratic framework, uh, neither being um, uh, incentivized to be re to do re uh, relevant studies and to to um, uh, develop excellence on a world scale, excellence <laughs> not local. Um, what is the consequence of 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 this? The consequence on the labor market and in pair with the structure of the economy, which is. Uh, on one side dominated by the state, especially on the demand side for professions that are uh, issued by the social science uh, programs, education, sector of the segment of the education, which is state. It's very formalistic. They ask to have a paper, a degree uh, on this and that, not whether you are a creative thinker, problem solver, and so on. On the other side, there are low, um, low labor costs attracted for indirect investment who, who are not so, ex uh, not so demanding, let's say, for <laughs> skilled labor force. L I would like here to, to raise two possible, uh, two possible consequences on the, on the labor market and on this potential uh, for using market pressure uh, to, to, to stimulate development of the education that we need, that we are need globally and we also need in these countries. And it's very much connected with what, what, what uh, you have mentioned, that they are meaningful only when we have a socially responsible market. In other, in, in other uh, situations, it may even be dangerous to erode the independence. Of the academic sector, I would like to share with you here one uh, graph. So first, this is this graph illustrates the share of scientific publications on SCE. Ah, it's okay. Ah, it's okay. It's okay. I don't know how that it's works. It's okay. Okay. They are result of a research, uh, and the author is is, is sitting here uh, in the third row. Uh, he scraped all the data from the Web of Science on all uh, war, uh, scientific publications in the world 
and calculated the share of Serbia across various fields of science and subfields, <laughs> disciplines. And what we see, what we see, does it work? Uh, what we see here, it, this area is, is underdeveloped social sciences, hum underdeveloped humanities, and overdeveloped or well-developed natural sciences and especially engineering, IT, technology, all those uh, disciplines, and agricultural sciences are well developed. How it, aha, okay, just one, one more graph. How, how it translates to the economic development? Well, uh, to be able to scale up and to well manage and to reach global markets with, uh, with uh, new startups in IT, we need to have good skilled people in organization, communication, management, leadership, and so. What we have in reality is, in fact, that the most, most of these companies are outsource, uh, outsourcing companies for global market. Very few exceptions are those that succeeded to, to, uh, to, to get value from their innovation and to uh, develop it on a global, on a global scale. Uh, on the other side, how it translates, in my personal <laughs> opinion, on the level of the development of the society is that we fail to design good policies, to make good decisions, both on a private, on the individual level, on a collective level, on a firm level, and that, that is something that we need to pay attention on in uh, when talking about skills gap and how to bridge it uh, on, uh, on, a global, on a global level where we all agree which skills are there. My concern here is that having this situation in many developing countries may result in significant brain drain on one side of and is skills, resulting, right? is already resulting, and on the other side, it will undermine and even deepen the gap in terms of development. And we may, we may miss the opportunity to catch up on this technological shift, which is in our favor, given that we are strong in IT and technology. I tried to draw some graph. Those points are different countries. This on the uh, on the vertical axis, we see the share of publications in social sciences in all other pu scientific publications, relevant scientific publications in this country. And here we have a ranking on Human Development Index <coughs> by the United Nations. Here we have GDP per capita. So uh, it's still, it's not the fruit of some uh, uh, detailed analysis, econometrics and so on, but it's worth seeing that there might be some relationship between um, between the, the development, the level of development of the society of, and of the economy with the uh, strengths in social science, in education and research, which is very much connected in social sciences, meaning the uh, our knowledge and our skills about how to organize ourselves and how to solve problems of the society. Thank you. I, I <coughs> Good morning to you all. My name is Srijit. I'm uh, representing I'm representing a logistics school from south part of India, Global Institute of Integral Management Studies in Cochin. I started this organization five years back along with two other investors. Uh, we are having one year PG diploma and two year uh, uh, MBA program in logistics and supply chain management. As per our initial plan, we took 120 admissions in the first year of our commencement. In second year, students' enrollment has increased to 260, then to 290 in third year and uh, 320 in the fourth year. And uh, now with 400 students uh, in our campus, we happen to be the number one logistics school in India. Thanks to the inspirations and guidance uh, of Dr. Gary Jacobs and Dr. Alberto Zucconi, 
I'm living. I'm a living beneficiary of vast conferences, and World University Consortium. Their visions and principles. But looking back, our sail for the last uh, five years as an institution, it was not that easy. We faced some major challenges, which helped us transforming and in adopting newer methods and approaches in teaching and learning. I'm from a city called Cochin, South India, where there are 72 business schools in and around a diameter of 25 kilometers. A competition, competition, as competition was huge, as an investor, I had developed a very good uh, career development and corporate relation team, which helped us in making 45 industry tie-ups, including Amazon, DHL, FedEx, Maersk, IBM, etc., where we were able to place 100 percentage of students in the first year because it was part of my survival itself. This acted as a unique selling point with which we doubled our admissions and hence the revenue. But the problem started in the middle of second year where some of our recruiting companies called us back and complained that your students lacks values and attitudes. Most of them left us in within three to five months of joining after their trainings and all. Another cohort of students were even lacking the basics of logistics and supply chain management was at another complaint. And some companies told straight in our face that we are not coming back to your campus anymore for recruiting students. I was in a false notion that if I recruit senior industry specialists and academicians as faculties, uh, they will take care of my students. These instances made us rethink about the methods what we practice in our campus. I consulted these things with uh, Dr. Gary Jacobs. He extended his time to us and we, some 20 fa 24 faculty members, sat for three full days, discussed with what can be done for improving the situation. My survival as an institution uh, was also threatened, questioned. It is a highly competitive world. In the meeting, we took feedback from senior faculty members, including our director, head of the departments, senior faculty members, director HODs, associate director, and they started commenting about some of the practical issues, what they are facing in the class. Teachers started complaining this, that uh, I teach everything, covering the entire curriculum and syllabus from Bharatiya University, which we are affiliated with, and from an industrial consortium promoted by Government of India, Confederation of India Industries. We are covering everything, the curriculum. But students are not learning all that needs to be learned. Second complaint faculty were making was students are not punctual in coming to classes, in submitting assignments, in completing their projects. They, they look forward for Friday afternoons because there is, there is an exciting life in the city, parties, travel, music, you know, Bollywood movies. Fourth feedback what we got was just pass, just for passing the examination, they just manipulate things, do not understand, mug up certain answers just to finish for getting certificates. And they didn't want to listen to us. Our relationship are not value-based. We have to often threaten them to accomplish things. Faculty members pointed fingers to management, you know, my team members as well, that you are taking everyone in order to meet financial targets and hence 35 to 40 percentage of our students are not at all employable. You are taking some fools to our school. They are in competition with themselves. Other than, other than academics, they are in competition with themselves. And hence, there is very less chance for team play, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and group projects. As our management team, along with placement cell, we are trying for industrial tie-ups in the first year, 
in order to take uh, competitive advantage through creating jobs for our students we clearly understood the requirements of logistics companies what they uh, what they are looking at a fresher they are looking for they are not looking for researchers or scientists with in depth knowledge in logistics and supply chain management but a person who can talk and listen who is open to learning and who is a continuous learner why because knowledge and jobs itself of today itself will be obsolete tomorrow so what they want is you know the people who are open to learning or a continuous learner they require freshers who can think out of the box you know having critical thinking who can solve day to day problems they like people with creativity who can think differently to promote their businesses and in creating delight for the customers and clients they require freshers with adequate uh, it literacy basics of ms office designing or uh, doing business online or sap operating systems you know i'm telling about the logistics sector who will not switch jobs merely for 100 dollars increment offered by other companies you know integrity and commitment they need people with common sense just the basic knowledge and having general knowledge about the trends of the industry and a team player without ego this is the basic requirement you know companies don't want scientists or researchers now we understand the genuinity of uh, the complaints we got from the companies we understood that there is a huge mismatch between uh, the huge mismatch, mismatch between the actual requirement of the companies and the system what we had in the campus we tried some experiments which later on proved as very successful for us thanks to gary jacobs again for his uh, uh, consultancies and contributions we created standard operating operating procedures for the entire in institute and most Im interestingly sop for designing a session a team consisting of one technical consultant who is an expert in logistics a faculty member an academic facilitator six students and one member from placement cell to design each class we adopted one day one subject policy in the campus in order to enhance uh, discussions in the classroom sop suggests live stories videos discussion topics games new trends in each class session where faculty will lecture only for 20 minutes in a two and a half hour session materials to read how every 15 minutes is designed with activities smaller groups for discussions presentation of the students and uh, their participatory roles are sent online before the actual sessions second thing what we did was we ramped we revamped the total uh, syllabus and the curriculum actually this was the exper experimentation we did they detailed research and identified 2000 concepts terms and terminologies each logistician should know and how we can uh, deliver the, this in the class we developed 200 stories to explain 2000 concepts each story carries real life logistics itself there are not as as such case studies they are not as such case studies but more of real life contents for example last year we started our sessions with a world cup football uh, match which russia was hosted when around uh, 4 lakhs uh, 400000 uh, peop new people are coming to a city what are all the logistics logistical and infrastructural arrangement to be made requirements of building new stadiums transporting the guests infrastructure and roads necessity of commodities food water milk etc even new airports to be uh, uh, built cargo movement etc a huge amount of logistical arrangements are needed through which uh, faculties discussed most of the concepts of logistics including warehouses transportation documentation purchase order invoices importing of items air sea cargo in russia football was imported from pakistan hence import documentation also just in time logistics hence creating a 
and in actual football, uh, actual movement of football inside the football ground to explain logistical concepts. Passing of football to explain intermodal transportation, opponent team as competitors trying to capture your consignment, penalty shootout to explain uh, free on board, passing the ball through air to explain air cargo transportation through ground to explain road rail transportation, ball going outside the ground to explaining contingencies which can come, referee's red card to explain custom formalities, so on and so forth. Faculties even compared with 2018 Russia with 2022 Qatar FIFA World Cup to explain strategies and planning of FIFA for the future. Finally gave an assignment to students to present if Cochin City, my own city back in India, is arranging a football World Cup, which may not happen in 100 years, who knows, what are all the logistics, logistical arrangements to be made, splitting them into groups and making each group present in the class and the best presentation is given with a gift. Hence, life itself is recreated in the classroom. We proceed uh, to celebrations and logistics, for example, same with Christmas and logistics, calamities, natural calamities at the time of floods, earthquake, or even fire and wind. We were able to connect with the logistics, FedEx. We celebrated FedEx Day, Apple Day, and Amazon Day in the campus to carry out uh, the businesses they are uh, and the business models and marketplace offered by them. Hence, creating student-centered classrooms where learning process which is, in, which is an informal one. We concentrate on knowledge of life beyond examinations and makes them feel how harmoniously the co-creation of knowledge and learning can happen. These classes helped in concentrating more on personality of the students than subject, curriculum, and syllabus. Another experiment was encouraging seniors to take uh, classes for juniors. We paid them for uh, hourly basis and seen that best feedbacks are getting from senior students and uh, senior student sessions compared with industry experts with the 30, 40 years of experience. Afternoon sessions are dedicated for career development activities, improving the soft skills which we were discussing. Uh, and leisurely sessions where uh, uh, interaction, role play, and acting happens, which we call it as global theater. This resulted in something, you know, we had a situation in the first year, you know, where companies called us back and told that we are no more coming to your campus for recruiting people. But we nullified absenteeism as they attend participatory active session every day than passive listening. Second result was we are able to establish a student-friendly campus where students and teachers work together for very, uh, every session harmoniously. Student references, you know, as an investor, uh, 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 this was a helpful situation for me. Student references for new admissions has increased threefold, making lesser investment in marketing and branding. Last year, among the 420 students, 270 of them were referred by the existing students or the senior students. Students started building enterprises, small and big, immediately after their final assessment because they are highly motivated by the new systems. It's a collaborative learning which happened inside the class. Companies started recruiting gym students. This, was, this is a dream coming true for us. Last year, companies just called, called us and told that you, you can send students. Without interview, uh, they were able to take students because uh, the previous batch students exhibit social skills, dedication, and high level of commit commitment at the workplace. Teachers, of course, are inspired by the change because they feel that something significant they are contributing in the classrooms. There is a co-creation of knowledge, there is exchange of ideas. The class sessions are framed along with a group of students. Students are taking care of two hours of sessions. Lecture is happening only 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So it is a contextual way and the, the life itself is recreated in the class. I feel happy, people in the uh, campus feel happy, rejoiced making life at gyms, memorable every day. Thank you very much.